Let's open our Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5. Matthew, chapter 5. We're still in the middle of the Beatitudes and the first part of Christ's Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. Notice verse 9 as we keep going. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. We said at the start of this sermon that the Jews were expecting a king and a kingdom. And uh, in this sermon, Christ is outlining the eventual constitution of that future kingdom when it comes. And only a literal premillennial position is going to make any sense of the sermon in the end. When you make everything figurative or symbolic and uh, spiritualize everything, and you don't stick strictly to the actual words on the pages of the verse or the, or the, the verse or the pages of the Bible, then anybody's interpretation is just as valid as anyone else's because neither one of you is approaching it in its strictest definition as you're reading it. This is what's wrong with so much of modern day uh, ministry, what passes as ministry and uh, Bible expositing and teaching. You can spiritualize much of it for devotional sake, and we certainly do that as believers, but you can't go all the way with it. The peacemakers will have to be twisted and manipulated so much that it won't match what's laid out in the rest of the New Testament, unless you're going to make um, diplomats and political attaches and foreign ambassadors um, into the children of God, because they're ostensibly engaged in, in negotiating peace from country to country. And from Moscow to Rome, Italy, every diplomat in between would have to be considered a peacemaker or a child of God because he's supposedly trying to negotiate peace. We can't press it all the way. Even if you pressed it all the way uh, in this age, it wouldn't make sense because Christ himself, by his own admission, was not here to be a peacemaker. Go forward to Luke chapter 12. Keep your finger here, of course. Luke chapter 12. Luke 12, and begin there at verse uh, 51. Luke 12, starting at verse 51. Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth? I tell you, nay, but rather division. For from henceforth there shall be five in one house divided, three against two, and two against three. The father shall be divided against the son, and the son against the father. The mother against the daughter, and the daughter against the mother. The mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And also John chapter 7. John 7, verse 43. John seven forty-three. there says, So there was a division among the people because of him. Chapter John chapter 10, just turn a page. John 10, verse 19. There was a division, therefore, again among the Jews for these sayings. He gave peace only to those who believed the revelation uh, that God had sent him and that God was speaking through him. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. John 14, verse 27. To everyone else who rejected the revelation of the scriptures and the prophecies concerning Christ in the Old Testament, he said things like, O oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and then, excuse me, and to enter into his glory? 
Luke 24, verses 26 and 27. Look at John chapter 5, if you're still near there. John 5, John 5, and start there at verse 44. How can ye believe which receive not, excuse me, which receive honor one of another, and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom ye trust. For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? Well, that doesn't sound like peacemaking to me. To a Jewish audience, to be a peacemaker in the kingdom will be to live righteously under the reign of of the king in his kingdom. Look back, keep your finger in our text, go back to Psalm, Psalm 85. Psalm 85. Psalm 85, and notice there, verse 8. I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace unto his people and to his saints, but let them not turn again to folly. And also go forward to Psalm 125. Psalm 125. Psalm 125 and verse 5. As for such as turn aside unto their crooked ways, the Lord shall lead them forth with the workers of iniquity, but peace shall be upon Israel. Who were God's people, who were his saints in the Old Testament? Nation of Israel. There was no New Testament believer in Jesus Christ yet. So when the Word of God uses terms like his saints or his people, the nation of Israel was his people. Now look at back to our text, Matthew 5. Look at verses 10 and 11 together. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. To those who think that righteousness is relative, um, do what you think to be right, um, let your conscience be your guide, it's how you look at things uh, individually, this text can be uh, very confusing. Righteousness' sake, there in verse 10, is defined as synonymous with Jesus Christ, verse 11, for my sake. Jesus Christ is the embodiment of God's righteousness. Look forward at Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Romans 10, notice there, verses 1 to 4. Romans 10, verses 1 through 4. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, that would be Christ, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Notice it doesn't say Christ is the end of the law, period. It says he, he is the end of the law for righteousness. Your right, the righteousness you earn, the merit, the, the value of your good life based upon your obedience to the commandments and so forth, that is no longer the way God measures righteousness. He no longer judges you by how good you've been up to this point. You are now considered righteous or unrighteous by whether or not you have Jesus Christ. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life, 1 John 5, verse 12. 
So if you possess the righteousness and the merit uh, of, and the value of Christ's perfect life uh, accredited, accredited to you and uh, covering you and your sins being put upon him, you are now seen as righteous. In the Old Testament, before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, someone was judged as righteous if their good deeds were stronger than their bad deeds. And most unbelieving people still think it's that way. They think, if I'm a good enough person, I'll make it. If I'm not very good, I'll go to hell or judgment, or I won't get to heaven. And if, as far as that goes, just about every religion in the, in the world has this idea of my good has to outweigh my bad, and that will determine where I go when I die. It's no longer that way. Christ came to upset that. Christ was the embodiment of the righteousness of God. He lived the perfect life that man should have lived but never could live because of his sinful nature, because of the, the nature he inherited from Adam and Adam's disobedience. Some people, now we'll grant you, we'll, we'll stipulate, some people are known for doing more good than they're known for doing bad. Most of us would never consider our own grandma to be a bad person, right? But grandma's a sinner. Her righteousness could never measure up to the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, some people we know are out there raising all kinds of H-E double hockey sticks all the time. And uh, we would never consider them to be a good person. But the truth is, without Jesus Christ, nobody is good enough. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Some obviously more than others by man's estimation. But the truth is, without Jesus Christ, everyone is equally guilty before God. So, before the coming of Jesus Christ, a man was declared righteous if he was known for doing more good than bad. The Bible would refer to him as a righteous man, a good man, a just man, a virtuous man, and someone whose reputation was that of doing more bad than good, the Bible would call him a wicked man, an evil man, an unjust man, an unrighteous man, a cruel man, and so forth. But that is no longer the standard. Now, to those who deny the absolute deity of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ wasn't even good, let alone righteous by his own admission. Look back at Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19 and verses 16 and 17. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is, God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments, and so forth. Keep the commandments proves that uh, this book was aimed at Jews before the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. You're not saved or forgiven or accepted by God based upon keeping the commandments as the Jews were. But they were at the time that Christ spoke to them, and they will be again. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. Deuteronomy 6, verse 25. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Revelation 12, verse 17. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Revelation 14, verse 12. So while the Jews at the time Christ preached were basing their righteousness on how good they could be to keep the commandments, they're going to base it on faith in Christ and the keeping of the commandments in the tribulation. But right now, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, verse 10. 
which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Uh, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Titus 3, verse 5. It's the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Ghost, who washes and regenerates and renews the sinner who comes to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Not depending on anything good or any merit of his own, any goodness or any good deed he has performed in the past to get God's attention or get into heaven. He's trusting entirely in what Jesus Christ has already done for him. And a great spiritual transaction takes place between the sinner and the Savior. You go from being a sinner to being a saint that fast. Your sins are covered by the death of Jesus Christ, and his righteousness is then credited to you in a great transaction, a great trade-off, when you say to God, I'm a sinner and I can't save myself, and I'm asking that Christ would become my Savior. God, forgive me of my sins. Help me to repent. Wash me clean from my sin, or words to that uh, effect. And God saves. God forgives. And you go from sinner to saint in a moment. It's not something you wait for the College of Cardinals and the Catholic Church to declare you a saint. You know. But you become a saint the very moment you trust Christ to be your Savior. Now, there's a, there's a difference between being a saint and living saintly. One is your standing, you are a saint. The other is your state, like your state of affairs. How are you living from day to day? Does it match what you are? I can live in a beautiful home in Beverly Hills because he's wealthy. But does the house look like one down the street where the trash cans are left out on the curb all week and the grass hasn't been cut and the swimming pool has algae and, you know, yuck growing in it and there's a mosquito. Vector control has to come out there because the mosquitoes are forming in the swimming pool. So uh, what state of affairs is your life in? So that's the difference between being a saint and living saintly. There are some people who think if they just live saintly, that one day they will become a saint. You've got it all backwards. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Ephesians 2, verse 10. So you're not saved by the way you live, but you are saved in order to live the right way, as a believer should. Now, last time... I checked, nobody was being persecuted for protesting uh, in favor of uh, illegal immigration or gay marriage or unrestricted abortion rights. In fact, you're usually you're celebrated for those things these days. Uh, so someone being persecuted for righteousness sake doesn't happen very much. But if you stand for Jesus Christ, it becomes a different story. Look, if you will, at Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, Acts 4, verse 18, Acts 4, verse 18, and they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. Look over Acts chapter 5, verse 40. And to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So that doesn't happen very, very often, but it does happen. And nobody, nobody is um, persecuted for protesting and, you know, marching, carrying a picket sign to, you know, object to... cross-gender, transgender racquetball or something. I mean, whatever the subject is, those things are promoted and celebrated in this crazy world nowadays. Uh, and they call it righteous. And they think, I'm standing up for something righteous. No, you're a pervert and you're a weirdo is what you really are. And uh, for some reason, those, pe those people get celebrated and uh, applauded. First, back to our text, Matthew 5. Verse 12, rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, 
for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. To rejoice is the hardest part. Uh, however, it's also given to believers in this age. Uh, Romans 12 and verse 12 says, Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Go, if you will, to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. First Peter three and begin there at verse fourteen. First Peter three verse fourteen But and if ye suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye. Be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better, if the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. Verse 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. We read about the earliest believers who were persecuted for Christ. And uh, we won't go back to that text. We were right there a minute ago. Acts 4, verse 31. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing, that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Acts 5, verse 31. The reward for one group will be at the, after 1,000 years kingdom, will be at the great white throne judgment. And for time's sake, I'll give you the references if you want to look them up later. Revelation 11, verse 18 and Revelation 20, verse 12, whereas the New Testament Christian receives his rewards at the judgment seat of Christ following the rapture. 1 Corinthians 3, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, and Romans chapter 14, verses 10 to 12. Uh, and in fact, I'm going to read that to you. You don't need to turn, but let me read that to you. Romans 14, verses 10 to 12. But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. That's the judgment seat of Christ to judge the works of a believer for the Lord Jesus' sake. And lastly, he says, so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Now that should be tempered with Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, Luke 6 and verse 26, Woe unto you, when all men shall speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. True prophets need to be distinguished from false prophets throughout the Bible. In chapter 7, verse 15, he'll say, And he that was, uh, no, not verse 15. I'm in the wrong, no, oh, I'm in the wrong. Wouldn't you know it? Pastor Mike's in the wrong book. Matthew 7. 
verse 15 says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. False prophets receive plenty of criticism throughout the Word of God. Uh, it's because they deserve it. And, of course, the, the primary standard or test is given in the book of Deuteronomy. When a prophet prophesies in the name of the Lord and the thing comes not to pass, that then the Lord hath not sent that prophet. Um, and to tell one from another is based upon their infidelity or uh, uh, unfaithfulness or their faithfulness to the written scriptures. Isaiah 8, verse 20, reads, To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. For example, Joseph Smith might have caught a lot of flack when he wrote the Book of Mormon and started this thing called Mormonism. But that doesn't mean he was a true prophet of God, just because he got a lot of objections by people. So that has to be very uh, clearly uh, identified, a true prophet versus a false prophet in the Word of God. Just because someone gets criticized and ridiculed for claiming to speak in the name of God doesn't mean that they're automatically a true prophet. Uh, prophecy is not just foretelling the future. We always think of a prophet as someone who predicts the future. But more uh, clearly, it's one who speaks for God, no matter what he says. Uh, let me give you a couple of verses to that effect. Uh, run back to Exodus chapter 7. Exodus chapter 7. And verse 1. Exodus 7 verse 1. The Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a god to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. My daughter was asking me about someone who thought we had prophets today. And, of course, most people think of prophets as the ones who foretell the future. They used to have a bunch of these uh, knuckleheads on Trinity Broadcasting Network. Uh, Paul and Jan would parade these people around who predicted the, thought they were predicting the future. And they're, It's always positive, however. They're always predicting a great wave of revival just about to sweep America any time now. And uh, because that's the kind of positive stuff that'll get them invited back on television. There was, and if you can find it, some of you who find these things on the internet, there was an old uh, interview of Walter Martin who was talking about some of these uh, false preachers and false prophets and some of these guys who are running crazy with the charismatic gifts and abusing scripture, abusing the word of God. And uh, the, the, host, I forget if it was Paul and Jan, whoever the hosts were of TBN that night, uh, Walter Martin laid it out on the line, laid it on the line. And without naming names, he was exposing all the Benny Hens and the uh, Jesse Duplantises and all of these people without naming names, but talking about their false handling of the scripture and their manipulating of people, etc. And citing chapter and verse and they say that was the last interview Walter Martin ever gave on television because they didn't want him back again after that. Because uh, I met a guy yesterday. He works with an organization that tries to generate tourism to the state of Israel. So he's always busy trying to get church groups to organize tours to the state of Israel. That's his organization's function. And I heard a story years ago that you can go through certain shopping areas, shopping centers in Jerusalem, and there are all these little booths and shops where the shopkeepers are working every day, and in the walls of their shop, they'll have pictures of Paul and Jan Krauts, they'll have pictures of uh, Kenneth Copeland and whoever other else it was on the walls, um, because they admire them, because those people back in the States generate money by organizing tour groups to go to Israel, go to Jerusalem, and uh, in, infuse the Israel with uh, American dollars in their economy. 
And so as far as those shopkeepers go, those American preachers are, you know, admired. They're heroes to them. But if you go out and preach a negative message, you're not going to get very far. But however, uh, Aaron was said to be Aaron, uh, Moses' prophet. But look back at Exodus 4. Just go back a page. Exodus 4, 16. And he shall be thy spokesman unto the people. So a prophet is a spokesman, not only someone who can foretell the future. So a, a prophet is someone who speaks for God and is supposed to be speaking and handling the word of God uh, correctly. We might say rightly dividing the word of truth in our church. And so that's what we seek to do. That's what we uh, hope and pray and ask God to help us do, is to preach the word of God with accuracy and clarity and believe every word that we're reading and trust it's the word that God wants us to see on the page. Okay, I'm going to stop right there and we'll pick up there, God willing, verse 13 next time. So let's bow for prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask you to dismiss us from this lesson. Once again, make us good students along the way. And I pray these things will have been instructive, not confusing or cloudy to anyone. And uh, it's my desire. We ask this now in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Hi, Brother Charles. You know how we always say the streets are paved with pure gold and all that? It doesn't say that. It says the streets.